Welcome, my friends, to the Sage of Quay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, our topic is oriental medicine and acupuncture. And to help us understand this very intriguing field of holistic wellness is a friend and colleague, Stefano Vitale. Stefano is a New York, North Carolina, and New Mexico licensed acupuncturist, a registered respiratory therapist, as well as a certified acupuncturist and herbologist with the National Association for the Certification of Acupuncturists. He holds a diploma in acupuncture and herbology, as well as the title Doctor of Oriental Medicine from the State of New Mexico, which adds the specialty of homeopathy. Stefano's website is www.vitalihealingarts.com, and his practice is in Wilmington, North Carolina. He works with a variety of patients, finding great success in allergies, gynecology, gastrointestinal syndromes, thyroid, pain, emotional disorders, sports-related issues, along with many other maladies using a variety of techniques. And to kick things off, I asked Stefano to tell us a little bit about his journey in life, leading into what he does today. And here's what he had to say. You know, I went through the 60s and 70s, you know, the Vietnam War, and that also gave me a little kind of a tilted viewpoint of the world, you know, anti-war movement, peace movement, blah, blah, blah. Then um, kind of got interested in, in medicine after, you know, leaving the New York City and trying to cool out from all the chaos and aggravation and, you know, aggression. Um, I decided that through sort of uh, meditation and I guess, you know, a certain amount of what you might call prayer or something, you know, that uh, I was looking for a profession that I could contribute to the world and um, not hurt anybody, basically. And medicine came across as an option, and I was kind of thinking about pre-med when I was about 26, and so I started taking pre-med courses. And then what had happened was I had a tooth abscess, and I was taking yoga classes. I was cleaning up my act from Brooklyn, New York, you know, moving into, you know, the new age, whatever. I had a tooth abscess, and it wasn't really healing. It was like six months was going on, and they were giving me drugs, antibiotics, and cocaine, and, you know, getting stoned, the codeine, you know, hitting cars, and <laughs> it was really <laughs> interesting. I was really, yeah, I was really over-drugged and, and not getting any better. It sounds like it. <laughs> I said, try acupuncture, and I said, well, what's that, you know? And I had no idea what, this was 1982, 83. I had no idea what it was, and so I went to one of the few uh, Caucasian guys in New York City that were doing acupuncture because the acupuncture field was actually controlled by the Chinese community. Mm-hmm. Uh, they controlled the there was there was a licensure in New York uh, really early on, but the Chinese controlled the whole thing, and they wouldn't even let Koreans in. It was really controlled by the Chinese, you know. Wow. People. Okay. So anyway, I got this treatment uh, within you know, two treatments, which I, I guess they were kind of close together. It was probably two or three days apart. The abscess went down, you know, like 60, 70 percent. So it opened up my eyes to a new possibility of healing. And um, things synchronistically were happening. Um, at the same time, I had won a sort of a, you know, a union scholarship to go to school for respiratory therapy because I was working nights at the hospital, trying to go to school during the daytime. And uh, in some ways, you know, they kind of, you know, bought my story, you know, I needed to get some help and they did help me. So I went to school for respiratory therapy at NYU, which is a two year, you know, allied health care plan. And uh, that got me into the field really fast, sticking needles in people and tubes in their throat and all this garbage and very interesting stuff, kind of very hyper, you know, active and uh, emergency care medicine. And then there was a school that just had opened up. After I'd gotten that acupuncture treatment, this guy, uh, his name was Zerinsky. Uh, he was a physical therapist originally and then went to Hong Kong to learn sort of acupuncture there. And he said, there's a school opening up in Stanford, Connecticut. Why don't you take a look at it? And so <laughs> this guy had just graduated himself from the Montreal School of Acupuncture, but he was he's a good academician. He had a PhD in philosophy, so he, he knew how to teach really well, and he was a excellent uh, student of Chinese medicine. So it was a good, that was a good start academically. And that's how I got into it. So now, Stefano, when you refer to Chinese medicine, is that synonymous with acupuncture? Or is it acupuncture plus other modalities or other treatments? 
Well, Chinese medicine is inclusive of acupuncture, herbal medicine, uh, nutritional. The ancient, you know, Vedic medicine is the same way, Indian medicine, um, Native American medicine. Uh, it's all encompassing. It's lifestyle, it's herbs, it's um, spiritual or emotional. So it's very comprehensive, and that's one of the reasons why I was very attracted to it, because it really it answers the holistic question mark, you know, what's holistic? You can't get too much more holistic than Chinese medicine and Vedic medicine because it's just comprehensive. It deals with emotions, pathology, physical pathology, uh, your integration in the world, you know, the, the whole concept of living in nature, uh, living in balance with nature, uh, which is really, really difficult to do nowadays. You know, we, we have more and more pollutants and more and more toxins getting in the way of our ability to deal with, um, you know, Mother Nature. So it's... Uh, but it's, so it's very comprehensive in that way. And the other aspect about Chinese medicine is that it's actually still educationally available. The Chinese have kept the academic approach to medicine available over the centuries, which is pretty amazing. You know, that's, that's not so much true in Vedic medicine. You have to find the teacher. You know, it's actually Maharishi is probably one of the first uh, guys that sort of set up some kind of strategy to teach people Vedic medicine, but it's kind of like you have to find a doctor and you have to, you know, it's really an apprenticeship thing. But the Chinese have set up an academic system and it's available to learn academically as well, you know, as an apprentice. It's not to knock the apprenticeship is a great thing, right. but that's hard to do nowadays. So it's very inclusive and it's categorically, you know, there's five elements, for instance, and the elements are categories like, you know, we have uh, categories for cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases and so forth, you know, and we have hepatic category and um, cardiac category, renal, so forth. And so the, the elements are really the same thing. It's just saying that in a different way that culturally people understood it that way, you know. So it's not like, you know, when we talk about the, the wood element, it's really the liver, the gallbladder, it's, it's the idea of you know, it's the hepatic function, and it's correlated to the liver because what the ancients saw in the function of wood in nature was similar to the function of, of wood in, or liver in the body. Well, I noticed on your website you talk about the elements. Yes. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Well, the Chinese elements, you know, there's fire, earth, and this goes in the order, what they call a generation cycle. So if you kind of listen to the, the way this cycle goes, you can see how one gives rise to the other. So if you start, say you start off with wood, wood will burn and then create fire. So you got wood and then you have fire. Fire eventually burns into ash, which then you have earth. So this is called the generation cycle. It's pretty interesting, you know, and you look at nature and you say, this is how nature works. And so what in our body is like that? And then from earth element, under pressure, we have rock, we have metal. And then metal gives rise to water. And if you ever go in the mountains, you always know if, you, if you're really a hiker, and you go up to the top of the mountain, you will see water come out of rock, always. And then water gives rise to wood. So then what's in the body is a correlate to that. And you can actually sort of look at this, you know, from the point of view of Western physiology, there are actually books on it. And there are, you know, practitioners in Chinese medicine who have actually gone through the, the labor of making correlations, not only physical correlations, but there are also is a, a physician, Dr. Hammer. He, he was a medical doctor and he was a psychiatrist as well. And he correlated the Chinese personality traits along with Western personality traits. And so he made that bridge in some ways. And so we can do that also in physiology. So the kidney is the water element, you know, and the water element, you know, has to do with controlling the water in the body, making sure that, you know, you can release it and, and, and store it and move it around enough. It's also a genetic aspect. Um, it relates to the kidneys, the adrenal gland. That also has an emotional relationship. So, you know, the, the aspect of, of the kidney and the water element is about willpower or fear. You know, the positive attribute is willpower and the negative attribute is fear. The wood element would be liver, gallbladder. You then can see how the element of wood, which is about sort of keeping things together, uh, relates to their correlation to muscle fiber and connective tissue. So that's how they see it sort of as a, sort of holding things together in that way. And on an emotional level, it relates to anger or to bravery or to courage. 
So when, it, when it's in balance, then you have more of an irritated personality, you have more anger, and that it ultimately affects the actual organ of the liver. And so someone who might have spent many years being irritated and angry and frustrated will, might get hepatitis C, or maybe just hepatitis in a very, you know, non-A, non-B, you know, that kind of, you know, undistinguishable uh, inflammation of the liver. And that's a lifestyle issue. So that's sort of how you can see how the holistic approach is clearly there, you know. And then the fire element is the heart. It's more complicated, but there are actually are four aspects to it. There's the heart and the small intestine, and then there's the uh, pericardium and what's called the triple burner, which is more of a hormonal aspect of it. But I'll just focus on the heart and the small intestine. And the, the aspect of fire is the ability to discern, to kind of like, you know, the fire element is this creation, this, this ability to instantly create that sense of the heart being right on top of things and, and quick and, and fiery and creative. And the small intestine is that aspect that actually distinguishes between what is good and what isn't good. So the psychological aspect of that is discrimination, being able to discriminate what you could eat, what you can eat, what you can see, what you can't see, what's helpful, what's not helpful. That's a heart, small intestine element that comes out through your senses. And all these come out through your senses, like with the liver element or the wood element, the eyes are controlled by the liver. The vision of the eyes are controlled by the liver. So your ability to see helps you to organize and plan, and that's another psychological aspect of the wood element. So it's very, you know, it can go on and on. It's very comprehensive. And then from the fire, we have earth. Earth is small intestine, I mean, uh, stomach, and, stomach and spleen, or stomach and pancreas. And that has to do with, you know, being able to take in your world, accept your immediate condition, to move things in your, you know, the earth element is about sort of keeping things, especially fluids, in, in containment. So someone who has an earth imbalance would have a, maybe an OCD issue. Okay. You know, something like that. Or, you know, you can also say, obviously you could say like ulcers. So the, the psychological aspect of it is worry uh, versus meditation, sort of like the extremes. And so someone who um, uses the the earth element in a positive way will be sort of sedate, centered, <clears throat> well-organized, able to sit in the moment and enjoy. Now, someone who doesn't have a well-balanced earth would be more of like controlling, trying to figure out how to get somebody else to do something for them, a codependency, boundary issues, you know, a classical you know, contemporary psychological pattern. This is so different than Western medicine. Yeah, well, Western medicine totally divorces the emotional aspect and the lifestyle aspect, and people are frustrated with it. You know, they really see, they feel and see the, the limitations of conventional medicine. But, you know, what we have, we have a big battle because it's still, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, and it's still quite difficult for people to hear me, to hear us, to hear, you know, my profession to hear what it really is that we have to offer. We do have to offer the general public family health care, really cheap, non-invasive, healthy stuff. And it's a shame. You know, I have children uh, that have would have been potential asthmatics. You could see it happening because when you see a child that has respiratory or ear infections at two or three years old, which is common, the uh, aggressive use of antibiotics at that stage is really, really detrimental to the child. It's very, very detrimental to the immune function. And they often will go in that scenario where eventually they'll start to get like asthmatic conditions and skin conditions. And even, even in conventional medicine, that's something that they actually see. Respiratory therapists and, and pulmonologists know that asthmatics often alternate with skin diseases that go back and forth, you know. But anyway, you know, if you treat a child with naturopathy, you can avoid so many, so many problems that uh, Western medicine actually pretty much iatrogenically induces, you know, asthma, skin conditions, gastrointestinal conditions, and then it's a shame, you know. And, and to get the information out there is really, you know, the press is difficult. It's a, it's a battle. Are you seeing a shift, Stefano, more and more people moving in the direction of the work that you do, or are you still seeing it as it's kind of touch and go, and it's still a bit of a struggle to get people over that hump? You know, because Western 
medicine has been so indoctrinated into the minds of the population. What's your perspective on that? Are you seeing your work expanding and reaching more people now? Absolutely, uh, but that's really an urban phenomenon. It could be suburban too, but it's close to you know large urban centers. New York City, Chicago, L.A., you know, uh, Houston. I moved down here to Wilmington, which is in North Carolina on the coast, about three or four years ago. You know, my initial impression was that it was fairly, you know, societally, it was fairly variegated. There was, seems to be a lot of different kinds of restaurants. Culturally, there were different kinds of people. And I thought, you know, it seems like it, it would be okay, you know. But most of my clients are not from the area originally. They're from outside the area, a lot of northerners uh, and a lot of westerners uh, from California. So there is still, I mean, in the south, I mean, a, part, a lot of that has to do with the uh, AMA down here. The medical association down here is really different. It's a lot more conservative and um, more difficult to get through. It's a yes and a no. We, we definitely have inroads to make. Originally, when, when I went to school, the idea was that we might even be able to move into the countryside as opposed to the city and have more of an effect on family health care. But, of course, the medical association would have to collude with, with us to have done that, and that was not happening. They didn't want to hear us. You know, uh, you know It's a struggle still. I still think we're out of the insurance. Most cities uh, and states don't really reimburse us for insurance. It's even no-fault insurance. Uh, and big cities will, will definitely reimburse acupuncturists fairly quickly because it's cheap for them. You know, it's like you get results, you know, for less than $5,000 easily. You know, while if you went through regular medical, you know, you'd be spending thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars, you know. So it's cost effective for the insurance companies to. Yeah. 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 You, would, you would think that they would be more interested, but there's, you know, they're very much attached to the AMA and to the, the, the medical profession wherever they are. So you always have to go through that. They're not really independent. And it's actually beneficial for insurance companies to have high prices in medicine because that means more revenue. Exactly. If you were to pay $50 a month or $20 a month for health insurance, that wouldn't make the insurance company really happy because, you know, they're not going to be able to invest much of their money anywhere with that kind of a premium. You know, it's a big problem. Now, Stefano, with regard to acupuncture, a lot of people have heard about it and they think they know what it's about. I mean, they see the pictures with the needles and stuff like that. So what exactly is acupuncture and how does it work and how does it benefit a client? Well, acupuncture is sticking a little pin, a steel, solid steel pin into the skin, about a quarter of an inch to three inches, depending on where you are on the body. And when you do that, the body reacts to it as if something is happening negatively. So it's, it's like, in a sense, you know, from a, I don't know if you know, sort of homeopathics is a similar concept. You know, in homeopathics, you're actually not taking much, much of any chemistry at all, but you're taking a, a signature of a chemical that the body listens to as if it's there. And it's the same kind of sense of what's happening with the needle. The needle is an actual invasion. It's an attack on the body. And then the body reacts. But because of the way and where you put it, it reacts specifically. The specifics is what we call reflexology. So you could touch a point on the, on the knee or below the knee to affect the stomach and so forth. You can, you know, put a, a, a pin in the wrist and affects the head or something like that. So that's a sort of a reflexological way of looking at the body. The ear is also, you know, the ear itself is the whole body. If you look at the ear, it sort of looks like a like a, an embryo upside down. Mm -hmm. And so you can you can affect points on the head by needling the lobe and around the lobe, or you can affect organ points by going in closer to the inside of the ear and so forth. So there's all these correlations on there, and they actually relate to you know organs and parts of the body. And that's actually not Chinese. That's French. <laughs> that's a, that's a French. You know, it, ear acupuncture really is from France, and uh, it was sort of like hidden for quite some time until the French went to Vietnam and learned acupuncture there from the Vietnamese, and then this resurgence of naturopathy in France happened because of that influx of information from Vietnam, and so ear acupuncture sort of blossomed in that way. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. 
also I had noticed you have uh, NAET, and that looked very interesting to me. What exactly is that? NAET is Nam Dr. Nambujapod's allergy elimination technique. Okay. First of all, when you have an allergy, you, you're functionally working from a lower brain stem neurological level, so it's a, it's a really a flight, fight, and fright level of thinking, which is very emergency-oriented. So most of the time, allergies are happen when you're in a situation that you're very compromised. So it's not a very high-level brain function. So you're making a mistake, really, for whatever reason there is. You shouldn't be allergic to pollen. Pollen is not a pathogen to the human. But what happens is there's some kind of misinformation at a particular point in life that your central nervous system for some reason is in a state of panic or semi-panic or some kind of very aggravated state and associate that with the pollen and then your body then reacts negatively to it as if it wants to get rid of it so what we do in, in the NAT is we take a signature of that pollen which is an a, a electromagnetic signature we call it an EMF and it's stored in sterile water water has the ability to kind of remember things which again brings us back to homeopathy, the same principle in homeopathy. So then the person can hold this little sample, and then we do a little adjustment, a little acupuncture treatment, and re-educate the central nervous system so that it doesn't feel frightened that that pollen is, is a problem. That could reverse the allergic reaction. Do you have a lot of success with that? Because I know a lot of people that complain about allergies. So I'm just curious as to your... Well, I, with that particular technique, no, because I think that there was a lot of shortcomings in it. I have adapted a whole new way of dealing with it. And I give people, usually I give people a little, you know, water samples to take home and to treat on themselves and to do other things that help facilitate. The theory is good. I didn't have good success with it. And a lot of people didn't have good success with it. And so... I actually do what I call VAET by Tally's, <laughs> Tally's like approach. There you know? go. <laughs> but, you know, and I think a lot of practitioners have done that. It needs to be tweaked, and and it's effective though. You can actually, you know, I've had people, uh, children. Uh, she was uh, this one child I'm thinking of in New York. She had a severe lactose a milk allergy, and it took me months and months and months. It took me about four months. Finally, I realized I had to give her a sample to go home and do treatments with it and then it was successful so it's been you know it's been an up and down kind of thing with that i think i have gotten much much better success you know in the past few years because i've honed into you know my own and i also use a computer which has emfs on it so a person will actually have bands around their head or and or around their arms their wrists and those bands will actually output the electrical field of the pollen so while they're actually you know, being treated, they're getting constant EMFs of the pollen, so the system starts to get more desensitized to it more and more. And that's way, way more successful than the old way of doing it. So, Stefano, what kind of treatments do people come to see you for? It's a, it's a good question. I think it depends on where you are. Um, down here, most people, the first thing they think of is pain management. In New York City, when I was there, for, I was there for about 30 years, you know, my patients went from, uh, like, allergies, you know, childhood respiratory problems to geriatric problems. And, I mean, I have had a lot of experience with a lot of different, but I think most people don't really know what we do, and I think that has a lot to do with the media, you know, and, and uh, the, the resistance that we have from the uh, medical association. Um, they get these little pieces of information about uh, maybe doing surgery with it, which is kind of very esoteric. I mean, what good is that? You know, that's just amazing. But, you know, who's going to get, you know, brain surgery on your acupuncture? You know, that's not going to happen in my life. That's for sure, you know. But, so back pain, neck pain, muscle pain, sports injuries, they're a biggie. You know, they're usually really pretty simple to do. They're really fairly successful unless there's a chronic organic problem. Lots of times back pain is a kidney problem. A kidney adrenal problem and people don't want to admit it they don't want to admit that they're exhausted and they can't they shouldn't be going to the gym four hours a day you know and drinking 16 cups of coffee like it's going to get your kidneys pretty overworked so that's another part of the, the you know the job that's kind of hard you know when when you have to address lifestyle issues people don't like want to change those things uh, myself included we're all like that it's yeah. not, i'm not being you know um, judgmental about it it's just a reality 
You know, most people want a silver bullet. I don't want to really change anything that I'm doing. I just want to get better. <laughs> How about rheumatoid arthritis? That's an allergy. You know, that's an allergic reaction, and it's an autoimmune disease, and then that gets into a little bit more complicated situation. But um, I look at autoimmune diseases, it's really an immunological balance that we have to deal with. A better example is sort of the thyroid Hashimoto's kind of situation, which is also autoimmune. But in, in rheumatoid arthritis, you know, we're attacking our joints, the synovial fluid and so forth, you know, and the, ten, the connective tissue in the joint. And Hashimoto's, you're, you know, your body's attacking the thyroid. But what's attacking it? It's your immune function that's out of whack. So what you have to get to understand is what part of the immune system is being overburdened and what part needs to be focused on. So there's, there's three general aspects to the immune system. In the old days, we used to call them B cell, T cell, you know, B cell function and T cell function. Now we call it TH1, TH2. I don't know why they changed that just to make it harder on me. You know, I don't know. <laughs> So, but, you know, what's wrong with B1, T2? You'd be one in, you know, B cells and T cells, you know, I don't know. But that aspect of the immune system, one of those legs are aggravated in autoimmunity, usually. Now, if two of them are aggravated, then you've got a very sick person, you know, then, then they have a difficulty with lots of herbs and foods because those are immune systems stimulated by herbs and food. So, like, the T cell function is, is stimulated by herbs like, astragalus and ginseng and echinacea and things like that. And the B cell function is stimulated like with um, caffeinated kinds of things like green tea and coffee and chocolate and grapeseed extract and a few other herbs. And just, you know, there are a lot of them, obviously. And there's, you know, the list is not really comprehensive because no one's really done a full comprehensive study on what that is. But what I do is I try to evaluate which one of those legs are aggravated in an autoimmune disease, whatever the autoimmune disease is. And then I tell them to avoid that. Totally. Never go. And usually gluten is another aspect, too. Okay. So keep them away from those things. And then they don't aggravate the immune system so that it attacks itself. Because if you start stimulating that part of the immune system, then you'll start to attack it yourself. So that's how you... You control it. You can control it, and you can have a fairly good life if you know that part of it. And this is stuff that I've actually learned from Dr. Crazy, and I want to give him credit because he's the guy. He's a chiropractor and a biologist and a nutritionist, and he's the guy who really set up this protocol for Hashimoto's and thyroid disorder. But I've extended, and I'm, I'm sure he does too. He extends it to other autoimmune diseases, and it seems to make sense. So I would treat MS the same way because that's considered an autoimmune disease and it usually works fairly well. And then uh, the other part that I forgot to mention or I alluded to is that there's a third part of the immune system that's kind of neutral, and that's the liver detox function, which really is an immune function, but you're using the liver to clean the blood, and that's stimulating that through glutathione uh, supplementation and with vitamin D. Vitamin D is a very neutral immunostimulant and it's an extremely powerful anti-cancer medicine and an immune, immune modulator, kind of like modulates the immune system. And then there's adaptogens, you know, like the, the reishi mushroom, codonopsis, and rhodiola and various kinds of herbs that we call ginseng is an adaptogen too that helps to kind of balance whether if it's a very high activity going on, it'll help to lower it. And if it's very low, it'll help to nutritively build it. So that would be the way I would look at uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And I'd also recommend salt bath, ultraviolet treatments, which they have. Um, actually, it's uh, cool infrared treatments. Um, it, they have these pads now. They're, they're like little sort of mattresses. They're about four feet long and about two feet wide or so. And they have these little infrared radiators every half inch or, every, or even less so that you can lay on it or you can wrap your arm around it or something like that. And they probably have more sophisticated things now. I haven't kept up with that totally. Infrared is very good for any autoimmune because infrared reprograms DNA. Oh, very interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. It helps to re-educate and reprogram the DNA somehow so that it balances back into, you know, what we call a physiological norm. It's a frequency thing. Again, it's against frequency. But frequency is a big thing nowadays in alternative medicine. It's actually old. It goes back a hundred more years, like Royal Rife sort of started it back in the 20s. He had a, a very sophisticated microscope at that time, 
and was able to read the frequency of pathogens. And what he did was he would then just output the, um, the same frequency. And through resonance, he would kill the pathogen. And he was actually killing cancer virus left and right. He became very, very famous back until the FDA and the AMA uh, got whiffed to this. The frequency nowadays, there's a lot of frequency type devices that are computer connected. They're interfaced. And, and light now is also becoming another tool that we could use, you know, using uh, a certain amount of coherent light. So they're making now devices. One of the ones that is becoming very interestingly popular in Europe is called um, photon therapy or, or photonics, I guess. You talk about frequency and as being helpful, but do you also find that a lot of the frequency and a lot of the Wi-Fi and the EMF that we have around us is creating problems for your clients? Do you see that in your work? Uh, yeah, I saw that more in New York City than I do here, because I think it was I, myself as well included. I mean, you know, you had Wi-Fi and, and, you know, I mean, New York City is just loaded with it. Um, right. uh, when I came here, I, I was absolutely overloaded with all that. My muscles were frozen. My neck was frozen. Uh, my eyes were crossed. I was pretty, you know, pretty. And I didn't realize it while I was there, but when I had time to kind of relax, yeah. I started to sort of detox and then physically recognizing the results of it. Um, we have Wi-Fi. We turn it off at night. I have a home office here in Wilmington, and we're on a corner kind of isolated. And we did that on purpose so that we would stay away from that kind of stuff. I think it's causing a lot of neurological issues, yeah. Uh, I think there is a rise. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it, but EMS certainly can be one of them. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, panic attacks and, and emotional instability happening that I think is related to it. I mean, there's plenty of studies that show it's a negative effect on us. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, how do you perceive that in the clinical world is difficult to tell. Yeah, that would be tough. It's just that it's so pervasive today. You know, people are just swimming in it. And you're exactly right. It's difficult to discern. So it does become a bit tough to be able to cut through that and decipher it, I guess. How about kinesiology? Well, that's part of NAEP. We do muscle testing. Um, you can expand it. I've also been trained in a sort of a psychological technique called Psych-K. And Psych-K is, is based on the fact that you're, you're being controlled by your you, you know, negative ideas and negative thought patterns. And you try to find out what negative thought patterns or what negative ideas are in your way of progress, uh, of development, um, of success, or whatever it is that you want to do, creativity and so forth. And the uh, Psyche technique tries to isolate the particular phrases that your subconscious is saying no to. And instead of converting it into an affirmation and just leaving it at that, it's taking the affirmation and then testing the affirmation. Not the negative phrase, but the positive phrase, and you're always going to be weak to it because you just said that the negative way. So when you convert it to a positive phrase, like, you know, you negatively say, I'm a schmuck, right? A positive phrase to that is, I'm a good person, right? right. Well, if you, test, if you muscle test kinesiologically, I'm a good person, you're going to be weak to it. And then you got the phrase. Okay, now we know what the phrase is, and now we have to figure out what body posture, what neuro, this is NLP connection. Again, it's a collage, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of these great thinkers start looking at other great thinkers, and they start putting together a collage of these wonderful little techniques that don't quite work all, well, all that well alone, but when you start putting them together, they start making a whole lot more sense. So, you got, you got now the, the phrase, and then you have to find out what kind of body position, what kind of eye position, what kind of, um, maybe it's a visual, audio, feeling kind of thing, so it might have to be, what do you see, or what do you hear, that kind of thing. And so once you figure that out, which is, again, done by muscle testing, then you go through that with, with the patient, with the person, and you say, you either put them in that body position, and they stay there for until they feel relaxed. And then you test it again. And usually when you test it again, you have a strong arm. So then you say, I am a good person or whatever. And then they test strong to it. Okay. Kinesiology could be used in all sorts of so many different ways. You know, you know, one of the old original ways was to see, you know, if your muscle was weak. That was the original development. Then a, a doctor, Diamond, who came up in the 60s, he was an MD. He wanted to see if he could apply it to nutrition. So he would have people hold vitamins and foods and things, and then he realized that you can use the muscle testing to evaluate sensitivities to foods and things. 
And so it kind of evolved over the years, and um, and it's, it's still growing. And you know, the creativity of how to use it is really up to the practitioner. It's interesting stuff, you know. Do you bring it all in together when you do your work? In other words, you know, you're doing the acupuncture. Are you also doing the kinesiology, or is it separate? How does that work? It, it depends. I I could I try to use it, you know, for individuals. You know, it's like. Oftentimes I'll ask, first of all, I'll usually take the pulse because that's my first muscle test. Actually, people, you know, uh, you know arteries are muscle. So when you're taking the pulse, you're actually doing a muscle test. So, and when you get sort of personal with the pulse, you know, over the years, you learn how to sort of ask through the pulse. You know, should I work on this or should I work on that? And then the pulse will actually shift a little bit. So you get a little test that way. Then I could also ask the person just doing a very gross muscle testing, you know, like pushing the arm, like classically how we do. And then I could say, you know, is it appropriate to do acupuncture today on this person or should we do something else? So that usually, though, when people come in, they expect some things. They expect if they come in for acupuncture, they usually expect that, you know. So when they expect it, they usually test positive to it anyway, you know, because they're ready for it. If they don't, then you got to really ask why. Because there's some information there that might be important and, and actually helpful and, and maybe dangerous, too. Because I've heard of examples. I've never experienced it myself, but I've heard of doctors who said, oh, can we do this today? And then kept on getting nose, 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 nose with the weak muscle testing. And sure enough, it was found out that the person needed to go immediately to a cardiologist because something went awry in their heart pacer or something, you know. Yeah. And, and that's a true story, actually, you know, that uh, a couple of practitioners, you know, you, you ever go to these seminars and people come up with these experiences. I've only had situations where people just didn't want to do it for some subconscious reason. And I would try to figure out how to move into another modality without disturbing them. If they expected acupuncture, then, you know, I have to figure out how to make explain to them that they should be doing something else now. Or sometimes, you know, you can do a little treatment of something else, and then their body gets ready for the acupuncture, and then you test them again, and then it's okay. It's a, it's a broad, you know, muscle testing is a broad, it really could be used in a lot, a lot of ways. Now, with acupuncture, Stefano, I guess a question would be, what does it feel like? Does it hurt? Does it sting? Most of the time, people don't even know they're getting it. You know, they, they, you know I put it, and I often start it, if I can, I start in the body, you know, in the belly or the back because there's much less sense organs there. And so when you put it in, most of the time I say, well, you know, I, I ask them, did you have, ever have, have an acupuncture? And they say, no. I say, yes, you have. You just had two needles put in you, and you didn't even feel it, you know? <laughs> so that's, you know, and you feel it more in the wrist and the arm and so forth. And uh, to answer your question back a little bit about what does it do, there's a lot of research on, on different ways of explaining it. But I like to stick with, you know, there's, research that shows that it has a, an, an effect on the immune system positively, it has an effect on the blood flow, it warms the circulation, it speeds the circulation, all sorts of things like that. But I'd like to, you know, say that there is also, there's a channel system that we call acupuncture meridians, and that's actually a, a live circuitry of energy that's probably looked at more like from an electrodynamic point of view. So when you put something in, or even when you massage, you're, you're instigating an electrodynamic phenomenon. Uh, very interesting. How quickly does relief come, Stefano? I guess your clients would ask you that. How many times do I have to get treatment? Because in my work in hypnotherapy, very mm -hmm. few things, at least in my practice, get done in one session. How does that work with, with what you do? Well, I usually have to take, do, you know, have an intake and then see what history is going on. Um, you know, if they just had a sports injury, uh, there's a good chance two treatments could, maybe even one treatment, um, uh, you know, you can move it. Uh, but if, again, if there's a, you know, age relationship, if it's chronic, you know, you could imagine if something's been untreated for 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do that. You know, they'll go around with this pain for years and years and years and not do anything about it. And then you have to figure out how to reverse that. So it's not that easy. Usually, though, I would say, you know, 7 to 12 treatments is a good kind of place to put your general topics. It's kind of hard to say. How about children? Do you work with children? Because I know, in again, in my practice at hypnotherapy, children are a little tough because they don't understand the process from a perspective of hypnosis and trance. But I'm assuming that could be very different with acupuncture and the work that you do. 
Yeah, you could treat children. I have treated children. Um, it, a lot to, has to do with the parents, believe me. Mm -hmm. you know, parents freak out quicker than the children do. So um, you have to look at the parent and you have to try to really figure out how to calm them down about things. And lots of times they're with nowadays parents are pretty wispy. So, you know, I have to do tricks. Sometimes needles aren't the greatest thing because they kids, you know, they, they get scared. And then I could use electrical current or I could use the computer, you know, EMF approach to it. It all depends. It's, it's definitely some, you know, pediatrics is a big form of Chinese medicine. And it, ch children will respond overnight. It might take you four days to get over a cold, but, you know, I can have a child, two needles, and the next day they'll be fine. The problem is, again, it's the parents because they freak out. If a child has a fever, you know, that I tell parents to make sure to call me before you call the regular guy. Because if you call me and I can tell you, go get this homeopathic remedy or do some herb or something, you might actually, you know, uh, really avoid the problems and, and get over it. But a lot of times they panic, you know, and, and, and it's really different than when I was, you know, when I even started this. Uh, parents have gotten more and more hyper about the child's health. And I think that's propaganda from the medical industry, you know. Um, children, you know, to have a fever of 104 is not abnormal for a four-year-old five-year-old, three-year-old. I mean, I used to, eight-year-old, I was eight years old and I had on and four fever. And my mother would just keep me in bed and, you know, give me chicken soup. And a few days later, I was fine. But um, today, it's, it's different. So it's socially, there's, it gets more complicated. Well, today, they teach the parents to think of the kids as not resilient at all, that uh, yeah. you know, they're fragile. And if you don't rush them to a doctor right away, you know, you're remiss in your responsibility as a parent, all that stuff. So I completely get that. Yeah, but they do respond. If you can get them into treatment, you know, animals and children, this is the old story, animals and children will respond much more rapidly than adults because they don't, their head doesn't get in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I also noticed on your website, you said, hey, don't come in on an empty stomach. Don't fast. Make sure you eat something. So right. what's that about? Well, if somebody's coming in on a fast, they could faint, you know, because if they're weak, you could put a needle in them and they could just not have enough of energy and they could faint. That's the primary concern. The secondary issue is, of course, if you're fasting, your, your pulses are going to be different. Your tongue is going to be different. You're not normal. So like, you know, and then what's that about? You know, it's a whole nother paradigm, you know, or another viewpoint. On the right. Person. So you could possibly then misdiagnose or something can slip through the cracks because... You don't get a true picture. You don't though. get a true picture. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, people think fasting, you know, they look at fasting as sort of like a momentary situation. You know, they don't realize that it's because you're not putting things in your body is why you don't hurt anymore. When you start putting things in your body, you start hurting again. You know what I'm saying? It's like they, they're, they're usually people that fast you know, in a way to solve their physical problems. It's because their physical problems is their gut. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a paradox. So they don't eat and they feel better. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> How about some of the foods? I don't know if you get into this. If you don't, just say, Mike, I don't get into this. But, you know, all the processed foods and the, the GMO foods, do you yeah. find? Yeah, I yeah. do get into it. But it's a lot of my patients are aware of that. But I wonder how many people, you know, really do it. You know, I, I'm pretty avid about buying organic. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I, I mean, sometimes I eat out and I don't know, you know, it's not like I had a spicy food or, or something odd. Or, but I just feel like my stomach is working really hard to figure out what the hell was that, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, wow, it's just like what? It's just like sort of simple food. So I, I suppose it's a GMO, you know. Yeah, it's happened to me too. And we've gone out to eat, and because uh, Rebecca and I try to stick to um, to organic, and you go to a restaurant, and you know, you're not feeling too good afterwards. Yeah, and I tell you, when I moved here, I got sicker more eating out than I did in the city. And you would think that would be kind of like the opposite. You know, you would think food here would be a little cleaner. It's not so rushed. I mean, New York City. You know, I mean, the restaurants are constantly busy and right. But I, I often would pick an organic restaurant in New York, but still in all, when I came here, I mean, I got stomach sick, you know, I'm out four times in the past, you know, in the first two years, so pretty bad, you know, I was really kind of, I think I even developed sort of a little pre-ulcerous condition from that, you know. Oh, really? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So that's sort of resolved now, but it was a, 
good six months last year that I was dealing with that. Not happy about that. People just don't understand. They don't realize their intake of food and whatever else it is that they're consuming has an effect on the body. Many people just don't think that way. It has an effect on how you think. Yeah, absolutely. How your emotions go, you know. So if you're feeling confused and you're feeling low, low key or whatever, it's probably, you know, something to do with what you ate. The other thing that we have a problem here is ascertaining, okay, buy local. Well, tell me if it's organic or not. Right. Because it says buy local, it goes buy local, but I want to know, well, how did you, what you, where'd you get that stuff from? Tell me about it, you know. That's that, an excellent point because I had that exact conversation with, um, we had the farmer's market here where I live in Raleigh, and they had the corn. So everybody assumes that the corn that the farmer's market has out, local farmers, is organic. And I asked, your corn, is it organic? And they looked at me and they said, no, it's GMO. Yeah. So you're exactly right. You have to ask that question. If, and more people ask it, then they'll still put pressure on the local farmers. See, they're, they're getting away with people thinking that it's okay. Right. Because it's local. And I even had, you know, we have a place here in Wilmington called Progressive Gardens and, uh, you know, a few co-ops and stuff. And I brought the subject up with them and uh, they don't know what to do about it. You know, they, they, I, you got to talk to the farmers and they got to come up front about it, you know. But a lot of people aren't obviously questioning it. So that's another. Well, they should have the farmer's label. That yeah. would help, right? Especially at the farmer's markets and stuff like that. So, yeah. Now, Stefano, what's the best way for folks to contact you? Oh, uh, well, I guess by phone or email. My phone number is 910-817-4449. And uh, my email is wind, W-I-N-D, wind spirit, S-P-I-R-I-T, at mindspring.com, M-I-N-D-S-P-R-I-N-G. Okay, and your website is vitalihealingarts.com? Yeah. Well, Stefano, you know, we're at the uh, the end here, but I just want to say this has been fascinating. I learned a lot. I'm sure I can learn a lot from you. I mean, I learned a lot from your website, your uh, you know Facebook stuff. And I was freaked out about the Catholic Pope thing, man. Whoa. <laughs> man. Well, yeah. you know, the rabbit hole is very, very deep. And <laughs> sometimes I've got to take a break myself, you know. I do a lot of alternative research. So I have my practice and I have this whole other world that I deal with. And every once in a while, I have to take a step back, you know. That's why... I do these interviews with folks like yourself because I have to get a balance. Otherwise, your head will spin out of control. Yeah, it's very deep. It's very deep, I know. I said I didn't know that stuff, but, you know, I've had a client who was a product of that. Very deep, deep, you know, kind of like, you know, ritual stuff. And oh, yeah. He broke away from it. I don't know how. I don't even want to know how, you know. So it's, uh, it's real. But uh, It's real. It's very dark. You know, people... They don't have to dive headfirst into it, but they really need to understand what's really going on out there. Because once they do, they'll start making some changes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yep. Too many people are trusting the wrong people. What's that saying? I think it was Gerald Massey had once said, the problem is that people trust authority as their truth versus truth as their authority. And we have a lot of people who believe the authority is their truth. Yeah. They have a hard time trying to question it and... Um... You know, some of it's amazing, you know, it, and like you said, it takes a little time, and what you're, the kind of work you're doing is, is very helpful. Well, People thank you. People still question it, you know, they're still kind of like, well, you know, you know, it, you know, it's hard for people to accept. It is hard because people have been essentially misled and lied to since the day they were born. Right. The whole system is rigged to keep people indoctrinated and propagandized to control their thoughts, to control their belief system, and... It's very difficult for many people to break that. Yeah. You well, know? that's part of the pattern, right? So it's like it's like medicine. You know, the same thing with medicine. You try to speak to most doctors about what they do, and they're totally brainwashed. It's like their thought processing has been just fried. Yeah. So they don't even think, you know, kind of like, well, it's just logical. Like, how, how, how can you not see that, you know? So it's a very, very deep-seated patterning uh, that you know the educational system is very very sophisticated about creating absolutely in the first and so well, I went to the dentist about six months ago and they were talking about fluoride and I said well I don't ingest fluoride I don't buy toothpaste with fluoride I don't drink water with fluoride and they're looking at me as if I had yeah three eyes in my head and you're exactly right you're talking about the doctors 
really not understanding or having a clue. You know, the dentists are the same way. They look at you like some kind of freak. <laughs> Yeah, even if they say they're holistic, you know, they don't even, they don't believe that. Right, right. The reason. And you can kind of like just go through the simple chemistry, you know, fluoride, chloride, bromine. I mean, it's like, it's the way chemistry works. And if you're taking fluoride in, you're going to displace all the other things that are important for your thyroid and important for your salt content. It's crazy. It, it doesn't, you know. No, it is crazy. It's just nuts. Um, well, we're just going to have to keep plugging along and see if we can get people yeah. just to change and shift a little bit and get things moving in the right direction. At least that's my plan. <laughs> Good plan. All right, Stefano. Look, I, again, this was wonderful. And uh, I'd love to have you come back again if you're up for it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Maybe about another six months or so or yeah, maybe even sooner. I'll, I'll email you. and. Yeah. If you want to um, you know, focus in on a topic, you can... Give me a heads up on it, and I can do a little research on it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, if you have some topics too yourself, if you, hey, you say, hey, Mike, I want to talk about this, then let me know, and we'll focus a show on that. No problem. Sounds great. Okay? Thank you, sir. All right, Stefano. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye now. Bye. And that concludes my discussion with Stefano Vitale, and I hope you enjoyed the interview. As always, I would like to thank everyone for listening and for visiting the blog, sageofquay.com. Please check out my other website, laboroflovemusic.com and take a listen to my album Leaving Dystopia and remember live in truth and always serve creation it's really that simple see everyone next week be safe and joy and God bless